Welcome to Dome Theory number 86. We're here with, back on the show, probably the quickest turnaround back on the show we've had, Matt Brooks, because what, what have we done? Four net shows over the last month and a half here on this show. Uh, we had Justin from Brooklyn's beat on a couple weeks ago, and you know that was right before the Kevin Durant trade request. I remember saying to him, I was like, as we were trying to figure out what was going to happen in the aftermath of the Kyrie Irving player option uh, exception, would Kevin Durant last much longer? And I was thinking maybe a month or two into the season, if things aren't going well, maybe you'll get a trade request from him. But it happened, I think, the next day or two after I recorded that podcast. So here we are four weeks later after that request. Not much has happened. And even this report that we kicked around on the Garn Report yesterday, uh, by all accounts now, a couple of reports coming out, is at least, as uh, Zach Lowe said, 10 days old at this point, if we're talking about the 16th. So that's fairly recently that these two teams have talked. Woj saying that these teams have been in regular contact here. And my listeners don't like it. Celtics fans in general don't like this, Matt. I just put out a poll yesterday. I think 60% outright said no way to any Brown for Durant flip. And oh. about 20% on top of that said it depends how much more you add on top of it. So our starting point here, Brown, White, a pick. We'll see if we can come to a deal here. But what was your reaction early Monday morning when we found out that the Celtics were getting involved here? Heard it kicked around a little bit in, uh, was it like early July? Kind of like right when the request, I guess, was made. Um, I didn't know if it, like, I didn't hear about anything about a formal offer, but I knew just, like, I heard stuff about a Jalen Brown, like, base package, essentially. So um, hearing that it was actually made was pretty interesting, um, you know, and how serious those conversations were, we don't really know. We certainly have a good feeling that, those conversations are not happening actively, but um, yeah, this was something that I, you know, I, I heard and I, I wasn't shocked to see it come out. I just was surprised, I guess, to see that there was like a real deal offer made. Yeah. So the Celtics, from my perspective, they must have had real interest here or still do maybe in adding Durant. And there's no surprise there. A guy like this can push you over that finish line for a championship. And he did that in Golden State. It looked like he was on the verge of doing it in 2021 in Brooklyn. I usually don't give them much credit. But if if a couple injuries didn't happen there, that could have very easily been a championship team. And he's still playing at that level. So I'm not surprised that they got involved here. I guess I'm just surprised that they went into the degree where this was going to get out. You know, the notion that they made an outright offer. And we've been kicking around for two days now what that really means, as you just said. Uh, but it feels like if they put Brown on the table and said to Sean Marks in Brooklyn, we're willing to trade Brown here, they're really serious about this. Now, does that mean that they're going to add piece after piece after piece and be super aggressive in getting this done? Not necessarily, but it does say that for the right price, they'd be interested in at least flipping Brown for Durant, which makes some sense. It's not a popular opinion, as I just said here in Boston, but Durant today and maybe for the foreseeable future is the better player of these two. Now the fit we can kick around. Yeah. Um, you know, I think people are, I mean, it feels weird to say, but like people are almost overlooking, you know, I get it. He's 34. He's played what 90 games in the last three years. One of those years is obviously because of, the Achilles um, recovery and everything associated with that. Um, so I get it. I understand it. Um, but at the same time, like this dude was averaging like what, like 29, 30 points last year. Uh, I think a really bad playoff series has kind of shifted the narrative almost a little bit too far in the direction of, you know, maybe Durant isn't that guy, you know, he's lost a step. I think those, some of those things are true, but you put him on a roster where he's surrounded by the pieces that Boston has compared to a Nets team that was, basically just in free fall because of how ridiculous last season was really in Brooklyn um, and a team that had effectively quit even before the playoffs had started. Um, Cause realistically that is how I feel about the Nets last year. They just, there's just too much happened. I think for them to really put together a good run. So um, yeah, I, I think that with all that in mind, with the context in mind um, you know, you're looking at getting a top, what six five guy in return for somebody like Jalen Brown, who's what I mean, top twenty, top twenty five. I mean, in, in that way, 
I'm always in favor of the team getting the best guy possible. Like that's, that's for me who wins the trade usually is, you know, the team that gets that guy, gets the guy that's going to put you over the top. So what would it take, you think? The, the report said smart, mandatory inclusion there, maybe another rotation player. That's a wide range on the Celtics. Does that mean Peyton Pritchard? Does that mean Robert Williams? There's a pretty big gap between those two players. And, of course, I don't think you can get a deal done if you're Brooklyn without all the picks possible coming back from the other side just because of the remnants of the James Harden trade. you got to restock the picks there. So in my mind, I guess – from a Celtics perspective, the most you would give up is probably Brown, Smart, and that package of picks. If you want to flip a rotation play with Brooklyn and make this a little bit of a bigger deal that makes more sense, maybe you send a younger guy over to Brooklyn that gives a little bit more upside than one of their older rotation players. That's something we could talk about here. But ideally, from a Nets perspective, what is the final trade package look like if these two sides were able to get something done? Got to remember that the Nets want to remain competitive. Um, they want to retool rather than rebuild just because they don't have their picks. Now, the thing that is that is the advantage for Boston is that I think most of us realize by now this rumor is coming out, not because these conversations are active, but because the Nets are attempting to generate more of a trade market for Durant. Because really, I mean, what, the biggest suitors were Miami, which is like a hero Duncan Robinson package. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't even need to get started on two guys that basically got played out of the rotation. Um, Phoenix obviously now can't really do anything until January. Toronto hasn't been willing to put in Scotty Barnes. So it really becomes like, all right, you know, the Nets are trying to generate a market, but if the market isn't there and things get contentious by the time training camp rolls around Durant, you know, either sits out or he's just uninvolved completely. Um, then that's kind of an advantage for the Celtics. And even though the Nets may be asking for, you know, somebody like Marcus Smart next to Jalen Brown, if there's no other off, you know, offers or anything like that that Brooklyn can go for, then I actually kind of think that the Celtics, weirdly enough, even though they're the team getting the best player involved, um, they're a little bit in the driver's seat just because they can say, well, okay, well, what else, what else is out there? Like, what other offers are you guys getting? Yeah, what's the power of Brown individually in this? <laughs> if there's nothing else out there you could feasibly say brown alone and this is probably why the offer looks like it does here maybe you tack on another pick or two and if that ends up being how the nets sweeten this for themselves but brown and white as far as players go that's the most that the celtics want to take away from their team right now and that's the most that the nets can feasibly get uh from any team could just because of this ben simmons situation we can talk about that in a minute just how that could be the Nets' next step in, to, in, in terms of making themselves more flexible here. But what is that power of Brown here? Like, would the Nets just eventually say, all right, we'll take Brown because that's such a good starting point for our franchise here? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is that they want an all-star caliber player. So that's the only guy we've really heard in return for somebody like Durant. You know, there hasn't been a situation where somebody like Brandon Ingram's been involved. Um, you know, Aiton's probably one of the best, I guess, you know, I mean, he's not all-star level, but he's one of the better players that has been involved, at least in some, you know, trade rumors. Maybe Siakam is another guy that um, could have been. That can't be too exciting for Brooklyn, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, like it's it's kind of, Brown is like somebody you can really build around in a way. Um, you could put him next to Ben Simmons, and that's a solid, if not spectacular, you know, it's a team, they're not going to win at all, but it's going to be a team that you can at least sell yourself on, you know, Simmons as the third guy, Jalen Brown as the second guy then it just becomes a question of like getting your main guy. Um, but if you're the Nets and you're trying to remain competitive in the interim and, and stay in the playoff hunt while you're waiting for that next, whatever Kevin Durant like player, if you can find that guy, um, that's an attractive option. Yeah, it definitely is. And that's, I guess my first big con here, if we're going to kick around some pros and cons of this for Boston is that if you send Jalen Brown to Brooklyn and it becomes his show and he's able to, grow over the next year or two here maybe sign another contract there i think that's probably appealing to the nets of the fact that in a big market like new york you probably have a pretty good shot at keeping him beyond that contract depending on how the roster ends up looking in a few years like all with all of that but it's not like you're orlando or you're sacramento or something like that like you're in new york city you're probably gonna have a pretty good shot at keeping this guy if this is gonna become his team now uh you're going over there i know it's a short contract right now that he's on but the big con for boston Regardless of how it goes for Durant in Boston, 
I think Brown would end up being a monster in Brooklyn with the Mm -hmm. ball in his hands, able to run pick and roll. And, you know, this might be how it's good for both sides and everybody involved. Brown gets his own team. If that's something that he desires, he gets to expand his game and become a superstar down there. Because, again, you just look at the way he bounces around screens with the ball in his hands. And some of the passing stats that Zach Lowe kicked around earlier were pretty impressive, more than I knew Mm. he was capable of. And then, you know, the turnovers, you got to cut down, but that might be something he gets better at with more reps. And the Nets would certainly at that point have a little more leeway to develop him and some other young guys, as well as Simmons, who could probably take the load off him there a little bit. That's a good duo. You'd love to have Smart there too, but if you're getting Brown, maybe you just don't drive that hard of a bargain if you're Brooklyn. So at the end of the day, Nets end up with their star. Celtics take a big gamble, but one that could push them over the finish line for a championship. I know our commenters hate it and all that, but th- there's a lot to love here, really, all around. Brown, Nets, Celtics, and maybe there's a deal to be had that, you know, isn't like Cat uh, Edwards' seven picks level here. Because that always seemed like what the Durant trade would look like, right? But it's just not going to get there, it doesn't seem like. The market isn't strong enough. Yeah, um, it, it, it seems like, I mean, it, I don't know what the Nets, and I, I do think the Nets are playing a little bit of a dangerous game. And I, I was kind of, I raised an eyebrow, I guess, a little bit at this rumor coming out when it did, um, you know, after really this was something that was kicked around early July. Um, I'm wondering if if that was something that, you know, now they're like, uh-oh, we didn't get the market we thought we were going to get. Let's try to put this out there to either reinvigorate uh, Boston or just try to like generate. So yeah, it seems buzz. pretty clear. That's why they did it. Does that hurt the chance that this actually happens? Cause the, I, I, I mean, this know. doesn't look good for the Celtics the last couple of days here with the SMH tweet and everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, it could go two ways. It could force their hand or it could really like push them out and just be like, you know what? Like, I don't want to, we don't want to deal with this. Like, you know, yeah. this, this was supposed to be a good faith um, negotiation. And instead you've kind of, you've completely torn up our locker room um, for, for, you know, reasons that we don't really think is fair. So I, I could see it going either way. And I guess we'll, we'll kind of find out over the next couple of weeks. So where else could Brooklyn go? Let's say this is over now. It was weeks ago. They throw this out there for some leverage with other teams. And this is in the past. You, you mentioned Toronto. I think that's an intriguing destination, but you don't love even if Van Vliet ends up in it, I guess, and I haven't thrown around the salaries on this deal in particular, but uh, if it's like Trent Van Vliet and Siakam and maybe some money going back and forth there, do, do you need Barnes? Is that the next guy? And how resistant do you think Toronto is to giving up a guy like that? It doesn't seem like they have any interest in that at all. Yeah, because it's like, do you feel like if you're Toronto, you give up OG Ananobi? maybe Scotty Barnes, like, is that, do you feel like a Siakam, Fred Van Vliet, um, KD team with like pretty, I mean, not great depth. I mean, it's, you know, do you feel like that team is going to be the one that's going to put you over the top? I don't know. And I think it seems like they're kind of like, they're doing the classic, like we're building for two eras. We're going to be competitive in the, in the, uh, in the interim, but we also have this guy at Scotty Barnes. We're going to see what that looks like for the next generation of Raptors basketball. So I, I, yeah, it doesn't feel like that's a situation where that makes sense. Whereas, you know, where, when they traded for Kawhi, they were that close. Like, they were that team that was in the conference finals, couldn't get over the top against LeBron. All right, we're going to add Kawhi for DeMar DeRozan and, and Pirtle, and um, essentially we're, that's going to be the trade for us that um, that is going to put us in that title conversation. So I, I, didn't, I think Boston's kind of in the same uh, situation here so where, where they're kind of like that Toronto right now. Yeah, and they may be able to make up for it with picks. I think the Celtics are at five picks right now that they could possibly give up just because they've given up this year's and the 28th swap. I, I think the Raptors effectively have all of theirs for the foreseeable future. Suns, too, although they might be missing a Paul one. So I guess the next guy would be Mikhail Bridges, and he could wait till January to get Aiden involved in that or something, and it would depend how the Suns do here, but... It looks like there's a real chance, we don't even have to discuss the Miami package, that this goes to training camp. And that's, that's I think, the question everybody has right now, is what happens when this goes to training camp? Is Durant done with this situation? I don't think he's made enough noise for anyone to believe that, but if the Nets are trying to generate some interest right here, 
at least seems like they're heavily entertaining the fact that they do have to trade him here and there's not a lot of hope to bring him back. But we just haven't heard enough from Durant. And that's the tough part in assessing this. What does he want? Why is he leaving? Is there any chance that he waits? Those three big questions. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I would say he's probably, I mean, who knows? We really don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know. Durant's never asked for a trade. So we don't know what type of a guy he's, he's going to be. Is he going to be, is this going to be a James Harden situation where he's partying? Probably not. That's not KD. Um, I do think KD will report to camp. I would, you know, I'm assuming he'll play for, you know, if this goes into the season, he'll play for the Nets, but I think it'll be the vibe that will be off. You know, that's, Duran is, you know, he's somebody that has, I think, sulked in certain situations. There was a lot of reporting when he was in Golden State um, that kind of indicated that. So I could see that being more of the situation where it's like, yeah, he's playing, but it's like he seems removed from the team almost. And he's just showing up. He's, you know, he's playing, but it's it's not like he's a part of the Nets in a way. So in that sense, I also could see that derailing a team, maybe not in the way where he's like actually missing time, but um, it's derailing the team in terms of this. They're just not, there's no identity to this group. Yeah, and the motive's a big one, too. It, could you save it by extending Irving? It, was this a move that was made in defense of Irving? Is he done with Irving? Like Those are the two routes that he could potentially be taking here that have very different outcomes. And I guess from my view, the situation seems to be that ownership has kind of put its foot down on Irving and his future there, and Durant doesn't like the look of a future beyond Irving there, possibly just because there's no upside to trading Irving right now beyond bringing back Russ and some picks or uh, rewriting some other contracts back because the value just isn't there for Irving. Never mind Durant around the league. Yeah. Uh, Kyrie, I mean, you'd be trading him at absolute lowest value. I mean, maybe you can get him there and he'll look good for till February. And the idea is you'd be able to move him then. Um, you know, I, I just, I think ownership is pretty done with, um, you know, both really. I mean, I think they want to bring back Durant, but they recognize like if, if there's no way to bring back Durant without having Kyrie involved, um, I, I think they'd honestly be more open to just ending this thing and trying to start fresh. So that's another thing to think about when you're looking at it from the net side, even though they may posture, Hey, we're fine. We kind of want to run this back. Um, I'm a little skeptical of that in a way and always really have been. Wow. I know it's tough to tell now, but <laughs> if you had a guess, what do you think the outcome is to all this? Like, the, we went through this with the Harden situation midseason, and it was like, wow, this is so far fetched. You can't even really imagine how this comes out. And it did end up being a pretty far fetched outcome with Simmons and Harden swapping sides. But you could have imagined that at the time. It was like, all right, Simmons is on this deal, Harden's on this deal, both sides need to get out from these guys. And Maybe just flip them. I think the original idea was Kyrie for uh, Simmons, but then it ended up being Harden after he took his seat. But I can't even imagine what this is going to look like when everything, when all the dust settles. It's it's just so hard to imagine where all these different pieces fall. Have you kind of imagined what this is going to look like when it ends? Yeah, I mean, I think this Boston thing, to me, it makes the most sense for both sides. Um, and I wonder if it's going to be like these two teams are going to meet in the middle. It'll be, you know, Jalen Brown, Derek White, maybe like a Grant Williams, somebody like that. Maybe that's too much. Uh, and like two picks or something like that. Like, I, I I, feel like right now we're looking at this. That would probably make the most sense if if they really do, if, if this is really something that just doesn't come together and maybe Boston pulls out. Um, you know, I, I could see something like the Nets waiting until – January because the Suns are going to probably be the most desperate team going forward. Um, that's another option. So uh, those are the two I'm watching right now. Um, but it's, it's hard to say, you know, maybe somebody gets off to a really hot start that we don't expect um, like a Memphis or, or something like that. And, and they're thinking, Hey, like, what if this is our year? What if we need a Kevin Durant? I mean, it's just, it's kind of hard to tell right now, but it's pretty, I think it's safe to say that the market is not bearing anybody um, outside of hypothetically Boston they would want to do something like this, this drastic with a player 34 years old. And maybe that's the opportunity that the Celtics saw. Maybe they just thought we could get in at such a low price here. And it's not like Brown's a low price, but the upgrade is Brown to Durant. And then you're not much beyond that. You mentioned White. That didn't go too well in Boston. So you're basically just moving off that money as salary matching. And you've already replaced White effect. And so that'd be huge to keep the Brogdon smart duo intact. So if Pritchard and then Grant, I see in. <laughs> in a bleacher report 
probably looking for at least 440 extension, maybe as much as 480 and a Keldon Johnson type deal. That's not going to happen in Boston. <laughs> so it would make sense to deal as well, potentially. And, you know, again, I, I, I'd extend picks. I'm not, I'm not worried about five first round picks if Durant's coming back, but I do want to get back into the pros and cons first. Athletic greens. We've been telling you about them on the garden report. Huge, huge time for us right now on the Garden Report. And, of course, here at Dome Theory, uh, they're giving you five free travel packs, which you just rip open, pour in your water. It's nutrients. It's probiotics. It's a little bit of everything that you need for your nutrition. And they're giving you a free year supply of vitamin D as well. It tastes great. It's good powder. It's just like kind of like a pro- protein shake you make it in your protein shake it's a million different ways you can go with this but if you go over there purchase something people love this go don't take my word for it read the reviews it's a very very popular product and again we're on kind of like a testing basis with them right now in the garden report for the show if you go over there get something you get all of this i'm john zanis at john underscore zanis he's going to give you a t-shirt so all of that's coming your way you get a great product here with that book the greens go over to athletic mom slash garden again your nutrition gut health whole body vitality that's all you're getting not products in a blend it's one power you're getting all these different things in different places different meals different whatever throughout the day to try to get all these nutrition uh vitamins everything you need for just one powder one scoop every morning they even have a 60 day money back guarantee i see here so there's really no downside a lot of bonus to try and and you're helping us here at clns media so go over to athleticgreens.com slash garden one year supply of vitamin d five free travel packs and a t-shirt so can't beat at that matt we're gonna move on <laughs> pros to this deal for boston this is what i got i love duran again this isn't very popular but i'm gonna try to pitch celtics fans on it here because there's a guy, as you said, 52% from the field, a staggering mid-range efficiency. Uh, my first pro is that this guy is going to solve so much of the offensive stagnancy we saw from the Celtics, not only in the finals, but in the playoffs as a whole. They'd go minutes and minutes and minutes without being able to get a bucket. Turnovers, an immense, immense problem. It was Brown, but it was more so smart and Tatum in that position during the playoffs. Durant would have the ball in his hands a lot more be doing more with it and of course it would probably change the style of the offense somewhat but if you have a guy that can put the ball in the net at the efficiency he can I think that would just knock off a lot of stagnancy in the offense but some of the struggles we saw Jason Tatum go through and Jason Tatum I I know he's effective with the ball in his hands but I think he's a guy who could pretty effectively move into more of an off-ball role we've seen him kill it in catch and shoot spots in the past that was effectively his role the first couple years in the league a good cutter started screening and rolling more last year you might be able to see these two guys play at each other at a high level so i know brown's a great scorer and own upside of being able to play on tatum's level but you think of just the pressure that tatum's received from defenses Durant would be taking that on, has obviously dealt with that for years, and would probably take Tatum's game to a next level, along with the offense here in Boston as a whole. Like, that is the biggest pro that really has me move like this. Yeah, I mean, big thing I like is you got two guys that both can create on and off the ball. You know, Durant is, I I just think he's a better playmaker than Jalen. I know he didn't have a great series against Boston, um, but he was, he was, you know, I thought he had a really good year. Um, in terms of the regular season, in terms of, you know, moving the ball, keeping everybody involved. Um, I do think he's a better off ball defender. He's going to give you more of that, you know, second side shot blocking, although that has declined a little bit since his injury, he still has nights where he's really, really effective in that regard. Um, And, and yeah, I mean, you've mentioned it, like the scoring is the scoring is what it is. Like he's one of the three best scorers in the league right now. You're putting that guy as your lead option or your one a, if you want to call it that. And Tatum is all of a sudden your one B I love Tatum as a one B. Are you kidding me? That's like, I, I don't, that, that for me, it's like sometimes basketball is that simple. You think about it like that. You think Jason Tatum, top 10 player, all of a sudden he's the guy next to another guy at that level. I don't know. I just, I, I it, it excites me. I'd be fascinated to watch them and just the way they would, you know, I guess um, 
you know, work on and off the ball. You'd have each of these guys running pick and roll. Tatum obviously took a jump as a playmaker. You can make, you know, have him run offense on one side of the floor. Durant fly off a pin down. Opposite side of things, you could have Durant run pick and roll. Tatum come off a flare screen. Uh, Tatum come off an exit screen in the corner. Um, these are all things that I think would work really well. Um, and especially with some of the things that Tatum showed in terms of in the playoffs, uh, his ability to get off the ball and relocate, make plays from there. Um, I just, for me, as somebody who loves this stuff, uh, loves the kind of nitty gritty details of it. I, I just, I think it's fascinating. I mean, really like to have a wing duo like that is just is super intriguing. I want you to dig a little deeper on the defense too, because that's another layer that I like here. I know and I've been keen on this as much as anyone that Durant isn't that force on the defensive. I think where he's taken as big of a hit as anywhere since the Achilles injury is uh, defending guys one-on-one sort of making those backside rotations inside playing center as a whole do a lot of that uh, for Brooklyn. They've had to play Drummond and Claxton and all these different guys. Whereas in Golden State, he was legitimately playing astronomically. I'm sure you could still get some minutes there out of him if you really needed to in the secondary role if Horford or Rob was sitting down. Uh, but I like the fact that it, you know, near seven feet with all that length, some level of switchability still. I think he'd be enough of a fit where Jalen Brown was in this defensive system. To keep this really strong defensive idea that the Celtics have right now. If you're talking about Smart, uh, Tatum, uh, Horf, uh, Durant, Horford, and Rob, it's a massive line. You know, you're probably playing two fours there, you know, maybe even like three centers, whatever you want to call it. But I think you retain enough switchability there that this would still be, you know, maybe not the number one defense in the league, but, you know, top five here and enough balance on both ends of the floor to make you the championship favorite. Yeah, I like the point about balance a lot. Um, I also like that, you know, you've brought up that, that the fact that he's seven feet, he does give you a little bit of Horford insurance. I'm not saying like they're at all similar players, but at least like he's going to give you another guy. That's, He'd be in that you know, front court mix, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which I like because I, you know, what Horford's going to be 36, coming off really heavy uh, playoff minutes, deep run. See what it looks like next year. He was He looked a little, you know, worn. So I guess the treads are a little bit worn by the time the finals rolled around. Uh, bad matchup also, but you know, I, I like that in a sense. Um, but the floor balance for me is what's really interesting. Um, they probably play a little bit slower. I think losing Jalen in that regard is going to hurt them a little bit. Um, but, but that's okay. You know, you're going to be a little bit more meticulous in the half court. And if we know anything about playoff basketball, that's a big thing. You want to have that half court offense. Um, and, and, and Durant's a guy that can be a practitioner in that regard. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to go small as effectively for sure there, uh, with especially if you give up small. And I guess that really is like uh, understand why they're drawing there because your your versatility, your lineup flexibility would really go out the window in a big way if you gave up smart in a deal like that. You, you can do a little bit more of two guard sets if he's there with Brogdon, uh, you know. And it depends if White's there too. I guess you could basically put white into smart spot and get some percentage of his impact if you really had to there but i understand why they're holding out for smart just in terms of being a small have their quarterback on defense like there's a lot of different things smart brings to the table in terms of keeping the team's identity intact that it's going to be important there but at the end of the day if you're like all right if you put smart in it's gonna happen if you don't put smart in it's not going to happen a tough spot to be in when you're talking about the possibility of acquiring Durant here but like we've said I think the Celtics are in a pretty strong position to call Brooklyn's bluff and say there's not really much out there so maybe they do have the power to retain smart here and then you're talking about a really good team if you're just swapping out Brown effectively for Durant Mm -hmm. yep I agree and I do and as I said earlier I think the Celtics are a little more in the driver's seat than Brooklyn would like to admit um, yeah. And I do think you could heckle over somebody like Marcus Smart. Like in theory, it's like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. Like why, you know, I'm mean, not ridiculous. Let me, let me take that back. Uh, but like Marcus Smart is a great, wonderful player. Him being the difference in a trade for somebody like Kevin Durant in a market that's really competitive, maybe not, but this is not that situation. We, you know, Durant is such an interesting trade piece because with how much parity there is in the league right now, you can't really, he's like the perfect market inefficiency in a sense where 
you can't really trade for him without gutting your team. And then if you gut your team, um, you're, you're not going to have enough to win with him. You look at Toronto as a great example of that. Um, so I, I think that in a sense, Boston is sitting in the driver's seat a little bit more than I, I think a lot of people realize. Yeah. My other two pros here, you mentioned one of them. I think there's a bond between Tatum and Durant. And, you know, if Tatum had to move into that 1B spot, I think that's a position he'd like being in because of the fact that I think he grew up watching Durant, looked up to Durant, these two guys. You saw him playing on Team USA last year. I think that's a pair that would complement each other personality-wise pretty well because I think a lot of the resistance to this move in my mind, beyond people's love for Brown, which I get, is their distaste for Durant. And it's been interesting to see him through Oklahoma, Golden State, and then into Brooklyn become one of the – most beloved guys early in his career and then one of the most vilified guys later. But I've always liked his edge. I've always liked the nastiness. I think back to that Philly game last year and some of the battles Brooklyn and Philly had where he was kind of snarling at Embiid. He went out and just in defense of Ben Simmons, annihilated the Sixers in that return game. And they just seemed to have like this F you attitude that I think a lot of Celtics fans got frustrated at times that Boston didn't have. You saw Brown kind of fighting back at some of Draymond Green's antics in the finals, but Tatum, you know, when he talked about leadership throughout the year and sort of his approach to that, he emphasized that he's just going to be who he is, which is more of a laid back, easy going guy on the floor. You know, there's not a lot of fire. There's not a lot of intensity to that. And whether it comes to criticism that Tatum might face in the future or just on court beef or any of that different stuff, I think Durant has an ability to kind of eat that up and allow Tatum to just focus on the basketball. But I guess the downside to that is going into a market like Boston with the media scrutiny, with the fan criticism at times, and just with all the noise. I mean, we know how receptive Durant is to the noise, checking Twitter and everything else. There'll be a steady stream of that coming in from Boston. So I'm higher on his edge and some of the nastiness there coming in because I think it's a good compliment to Tatum. But there is a worry to me in how he'd like this market. And people have talked about his comments about Boston and the race dynamic there. I thought that was more of an Irving-led comment that Durant went along with as his teammate. Again, we could dig deeper into that if we really wanted to. But I'm more concerned about just the level of noise that comes with being the star in Boston, you know, locally and nationally, that might get to Durant and just not really knowing what Durant wants in terms of a destination, a city, a team, a situation for himself. Because again, 1A, 1B right now with Tatum, the way Tatum's rising, Durant could quickly move into a secondary role there as he gets older. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Um, I do think Durant is motivated to win and he wants to be in a situation where he feels like there's infrastructure, um, you know, and, and, that was what golden state I think was attractive um, to him about obviously other things came into play with, with Curry and that relationship there. And just in general, I think the relationship with the fan base that you may run into in Boston. Um, But you know, I, I, I I wouldn't be as worried about that. I'd be more worried about some of the other things like injuries uh, just general decline. Those are the things I'd be a little bit more worried with like Durant for me, at least just covering him. um, He just wants to go out and hoop. Like he really, there isn't a ton of BS with Durant. Uh, maybe that is just because he's in Brooklyn. Um, you know, it's I like to call it like a, a big market, small market team in terms of fan base isn't huge. That's what I'm uh, saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like he's been in it's Oklahoma. It's the perfect place. Yeah. It's kind of the perfect place for him because he can keep his business ventures going. Um, but he's also, you know, it's not like there's a ton of scrutiny out here. No. And I didn't think there was a ton in Golden State either beyond the cupcake stuff and the criticism of what his choice. But I don't think it was a tough market to play in. Like Durant, uh, Curry, Green, those guys had his back. And the fans, I guess he sort of had a back and forth thing with the fans in terms of appreciation. But I didn't feel like the Heat was ever – I mean, they were winning championships. How would the Heat be on them there uh, in, from the fan base? I think Boston would be the real place if things went sideways where he might get a little heat from Boston's fans. But ideally, if he's healthy, if he's w- producing – and if things are going well, the Celtics fans are going to love him. Even if they don't love the move initially, it kind of brings me back to the Kyrie move. 
a little tough at the time. You're giving up Isaiah. You're giving up that core, that identity that they had for a couple of years there. Then when you see the dribbling and the scoring and all the different stuff, I think they started 14-2 and two that year right out of the gate. People were right on board. 11 jerseys everywhere. Everyone loved them. I think people forget just how much Boston fell in love with Kyrie that first year and even into the second year. So very similar situation, I feel like, that they're in now. That didn't go well. You said it. It's all about the health, the stability of him. My last pro, I love the fact that you'd be entering him into the Warriors Durant thing. Mm. Like if that became a finals there, all of a sudden, all the green trash talk and everything that kind of built between these two sides this year, you add Durant into that. I think some added motivation for him to go out and beat those guys. It's a big bonus and a big uh, point of intrigue going into a rematch potentially between those two teams in the finals. I That's what has me more excited about the possibility of this than anything else. Because if these two teams met as they stand right now, Celtics and Warriors, I actually think the Warriors got a little bit better. You know, you lost Peyton, you lost uh, Porter, but you bring in Jermichael Green, who's been really good in the past in that role, and Dante DiVincenzo, who, if he recovers from that injury in a rough year last year, is a really good wing player, maybe even more dynamic than Peyton was. So that roster's loaded again. And Celtics, I know they're championship favorites technically right now in some places, but I think they're a little bit short of where the Warriors are as these two teams stand right now. Yeah, I mean, I might be a little. Actually, might be the opposite of you on on the. You're Golden higher State. on the I, Celtics. Yeah, I, I I think Golden State dropped off a tiny bit, like I just a oh, okay. tiny bit. Um, I I really think they're gonna miss Peyton defensively. Um, just having a guy that can, I mean, he like changed that series. He was a honestly. big part in the finals. Yeah, yeah, just completely changed that series. So I I think they're gonna miss that. DiVincenzo is passable on defense. He shot the three ball pretty well in Sacramento. I, I I'd expect that to continue, but. Um, he you know, was rough in Milwaukee, though. Yeah, there's a chance yeah. that he just kind of fell off a cliff and doesn't come yeah. back, which would be weird to me because I don't feel what he tears ACL. That doesn't usually kill guys' careers anymore, but I guess it is a significant injury for some. Yeah, um, I, I don't. I guess it was a meniscus. I don't. know. It was something like uh, some in his knee. Uh, yeah, yeah, some in his knee. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's I, I, I like them. I, I do think they've lost like a little bit of. Um, I don't like them losing anything on defense um, because it puts that much pressure on Clay to, ha- you know, look a little bit better defensively. Of course, he'll be what two years removed from uh, the Achilles tear. Maybe, yeah, I think two, at least two full years. Um, you know, you're looking at Draymond is going to have increased responsibility. So uh, I'm, I'm, I like what they did, but I mean, you look at Boston. Like, and I actually saw somebody bring this up earlier, uh, talking about, you know, this is a two-year window with Durant versus a five to seven year window with, with uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Personally, this is just me. I'm not saying this is going to happen. Um, I can never go that far with any NBA team saying that, Hey, this core is going to be together for seven years. There's just so much player movement now that in a sense, if, at least for me with how I would build a team, if I think there's a way to win in the next two years, I'm going to go for that because there's no guarantee that the value of one is huge now. Yep. I don't yep. think there's, Unless you're putting together a Warriors-like team that has that run where they're just such dominant favorites for two or three years that they're going to be run, you know, just knocking off win after win after win year in and year out, the value of one's massive just because the yeah. rosters are changing so often. And there's a new power coming into place every year. There's going to be a cap spike in a couple of years here too, potentially as well. So who knows what happens with that in terms of free agency and some of the new powers that could emerge out of that all these windows are short. So if you're looking at this from the Celtics perspective, it's like one or two years with Brown potentially here or one or two years with Durant. It's, it's effectively equal. Forget the contract length, the age, all of that. The only downside, and you've mentioned, and it's really my biggest uh, con here is Durant's health. Now he, he sprains the MCL last year. That probably hurt him a little bit, but so did carrying the weight of, Harden's inconsistency and Kyrie's absence. I think those were all factors in his decline into the first round of the playoffs. But given his age, given his injury history here, you're probably looking at him as like a 60 game per year max guy. And you do have the depth if you're Boston to work around that. Tatum is such a stalwart in terms of games played, minutes and all that, that he would probably pick up quite a bit of slack there and allow Durant to ease into things. But for a Celtics team that's young, dynamic, and 
overall pretty healthy right now. I thought they were one of the healthiest teams in the league last year among contenders. You'd be introducing a bit of load management, a bit of injury uncertainty, and age, and a little bit less dynamic play with Durant than you currently have on this roster that's just flying up and down the floor, playing the best defense in the league, and overall pretty available throughout the course of the year. So that's my first big con here, and you've hit on it a couple of times, is what's Durant's health look like at this stage of his career? Well, the beauty of the Celtics is that they have the the depth and the the identity to survive, um, you know, putting Durant on load management, whereas you just couldn't do that last year if you were the Nets. I mean, Nash was playing this guy like 40 minutes against the Detroit Pistons and teams like that. Like, you just, you have the ability to do that, whether you're resting him for games or just, playing him a, a less minutes per game. Um, I'm also going to push back on the health thing a little bit. Uh, Cause if you look at two years ago during the COVID season, he misses time. I like that. You had that weird thing where he got pulled from the game against Toronto because of health and safety. Um, then he missed a full week. He basically wasn't practicing with the team was put in a game. I want to say against the Knicks. Maybe I might be wrong about this hamstring strain pretty much. I, I would say largely because they didn't ramp them up or anything like that. Uh, last year, even looking at the, you know, ha- the MCL sprain, that was a freak injury where he just ran into to Bruce Brown. I mean, I'm not saying he's not injury prone because that's obviously not a good argument. And there's the evidence points to the contrary, but it's not like this guy is like breaking down in terms of non-contact, you know, injuries. It's more of the a, a year ago, just how weird that season was. And he was the only guy left standing. Uh, for the Nets in the playoffs against the Bucks in the second round. And then last year, just a freak injury. So you can make that argument, I think, in a way. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much where the cons end for me, I guess. The only other concern I guess you would have is uh, potentially giving up too many picks here. Because, again, I don't. I think we both agree that this deal probably doesn't get done without the maximum amount of picks. Maybe it gets down to four or three, and they meet somewhere in the middle of there. But you would be giving up multiple picks that might – impact your ability to round out the depth on the roster in coming seasons. But I think we've seen from Brad Stevens trading three straight first that he's not as intent on team building through first round picks. So that might not be as big of a problem for him there. Uh, I alluded to it a little bit with the potential that Brown could go off and become a star. And that might hurt you a little bit if you're looking down in Brooklyn and seeing that, especially in your backyard there. But how good could the Nets potentially become with Brown, Simmons, yeah, I guess what are you talking, Royce O'Neal, TJ Warren, some of these other guys that they're working in there. A good young core. We could probably end the show kicking around some of the young pieces that the Nets have. I guess there's a chance of worry that the Nets can legitimately in time do this, if you do this deal, become mini threat to you in the East. Like I think if Brown reaches that next level leading that team and Simmons gets back to who he is, you might have a team with the right coach too, of course. <laughs> That can that's true. <laughs> legitimately threaten the Celtics in the East. And I think that's almost an underrated part of this. Like people have been asking, would the Nets send Durant to Boston? Well, if Brown and enough's coming back, you might say, all right, we're going to go beat Boston with the team we have. He could. I don't know if he will. I, I don't know. I'm a little bit lower on this, on this Nets team. I think they're like a really solid, fun team that'll hang around um, for a couple of years. I don't see them as like, threats to win the East or anything like that. I do think there's a cap on this team. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fun core. It makes sense for somebody like Simmons. You're putting a lot of, you know, shooting around him and wing depth around him. And it's a nice team with, with balance. I just worry a little bit about some of the half court stuff, what that's going to look like. There is a lot on, on Jalen Brown's shoulders now. Um, in, in your well, how good could you potentially see him becoming in Brooklyn? Like, is there a higher ceiling that we're not imagining for him? I almost wonder if this is like a it's not quite comparable because man, I don't think anyone ever imagined the offensive volcano that James Harden would become. But there is a little bit of a Harden feel coming out of Oklahoma City to Houston in a deal like that, right? Yeah, I'm probably a little lower on Jalen as the lead guy. I just yeah. personally, I, 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 the I know the playmaking numbers are better than we expect. It still just doesn't feel like he's really like floor mapping in a way that you'd probably need him to um, if he's leading the show for Brooklyn. Cause really outside of that, it's like, you, you look might at need the a Nets point next guard year. next to him. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and it's like Patty Mills. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, and even Simmons is like, 
yeah, he'll he'll make plays in transition, but you're really going to be using him more as like a hub in the post, and which is he kind of gives you varying results. Um, maybe even more as a screener. I don't, I don't know. Running pick and roll with him is a, a tricky thing, just because you can sag so low against him. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, I'm a little bit worried about that for Jalen where yes, he is, he's improved a lot and he's proved a lot in the playoffs last year to a lot of people, myself included, but it's very different from going into a role where you are not just leading the show, but you are the show, uh, for the nets. Whereas, and you don't have somebody like Jason Tatum next to you attracting all that attention. So, oh, I guess we got to consider too and this is the other hard thing to figure out here so you got Kyrie that effectively as we said maybe ownership's done with him but is signed for that one year and they're both on that Kanye Donda representation right now you saw them chopping it up is there a chance that they could kind of have this one year run here and maybe Kyrie reproves himself as a part of this core into the future there or if they trade Durant is Kyrie right out the door after Durant goes. I would be shocked if he isn't traded right after. Personally, I I just like I think the appeal right now of Kyrie to the Nets is only if Durant stays. Because in an in a in like as I guess an ideal world, um, you're able to keep Durant if you're the Nets. Because really, if you're trying to remain competitive, he's the best player possible that you could get. Um, but if he's gone, like I don't, I just think too much has happened. Um, even if Kyrie may want to stay. I just think the Nets are going to want to start fresh and and start over. And a big reason why things got contentious and um, have been, you know, really the reason things have been the way they've been um, has been some, some of the stuff that Kyrie has done, especially just this last season, um, the way his decision to to not play um, hung over the team. So, yeah, I, I would be pretty shocked if, if he's around personally. <laughs> Oh, man, I almost felt crazy myself when I was pushing that during the year. Just how insane it felt that he was taking that hiatus. But it did seem like everybody's (laughs) come to that agreement that, wow, that was pretty crazy what he did. He basically just didn't show up to the team. And when he arrived, it didn't go much better after that. It's just wacky how these three years here went in Brooklyn. And it looks like it's coming to an end here, which is kind of incredible to think about. I do kind of want, before we log out of here, your thoughts on the young guys, because I do, it's not the most uh, exciting topic in the world, but that young core, Cam Thomas, Dayron Sharp, got David Duke out there at Summer League, it's a pretty entertaining team. And Cam Thomas, again, for the second straight year, one of the better players out there at Summer League, felt like he got a little underutilized last year. I thought the young underbelly of this team, beyond all the drama and Kyrie stuff going on at the top, the lack of usage of those guys, especially during that stretch where they lost, what was it, 17 to 20? Uh, mm. They didn't make good use of what I feel like is a pretty talented uh, core of young players on this Brooklyn team. And so that could be part of the next wave too, potentially here, depending on what they get back for both of these stars here. I think Thomas is really good. I like Sharp. Maybe he looked a little better when he was playing off Pardon, and that's sort of what I'm still leaning on with him, but... You know, they have some guys here. Nick Claxton's back. I'm stunned they didn't keep Bruce Brown and they kept Patty Mills kind of instead of him. Maybe that's not as much of a trade-off as I'm looking at it as. But they had and have some good young guys here that could maybe carry them forward a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, the nice part is you have these guys and you had a really good draft and even just getting an undrafted guy like David Duke Jr. um, a year ago really your last chance at using the draft just because of all your picks going to, to Houston. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think in a sense, because of, because the nets are looking to retool and they're looking to stay competitive in the interim while also trying to build something in the future. Um, you have those guys, those are nice pieces. Thomas is obviously a guy that the potential is there. Like you can see what it looks like, uh, in terms of the scoring, it's all a question of what he's able to do as a off ball player. Uh, is the playmaking going to come along? Um, you know, are, are there is the defense going to improve at all? Is he going to start to learn NBA schemes in a way that's going to help the team? So, I mean, you know, I, I think that in a sense, they're still probably going to focus more on whatever they get back for Durant, um, at whichever player that is. Let's say it's a Jalen Brown, Simmons, and and a bunch of solid vets. That's probably still going to be more where they lean as they continue to groom and, and grow with some of these young guys that you just mentioned. 
it's going to be fascinating to watch. This really is the negotiation here. If it's still ongoing, if it's one that could evolve from here, we're both side significant leverage. The Celtics saying, let's just run this back. The Nets saying, let's try to do the same here. But maybe they're content with Durant and uh, potentially budding discontent tent with brown here after the smh tweet maybe pushes both sides to get this going a little bit here because i really do think there's a lot of uh fascinating uh, possibilities for both teams here doing a deal like this and you know we've kind of gone to a place here package wise that i think looks a little more reasonable for both sides too so he is matt brooks you can find him at nets daily you have a nets podcast as well where can people find that uh, you can find that on all streaming platforms. It's the Clear Out Podcast. Um, yeah, Twitter handle is obviously right here um, if you're watching along. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much all you need to know. All right, great stuff, Matt. We'll keep following along as uh, more Nets headlines keep coming out this, uh, this summer. And uh, we'll talk to you here on Dope Dairy again soon.